mean? Facebook Live. From the laundromat. From the laundromat. Are you telling everybody all our business? <laughs> now they know our dryer's broken. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, here we are, Bible study time. Are you ready? I'm ready. We're ready. All right, well, I say we say a prayer and just get into it. Okay. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be with us, to, to open the Bible, and to just see what your word has to say for us today. So we ask for your strength, we ask for your leading, we ask that you would just guide us because we are in great need of your help. We can't do these things alone, so we thank you, we trust you, we believe you, we have faith in you, and we just ask, Lord, that you would bless us with an extra measure of your spirit. In an unusual amount. In Jesus' name. Amen. Alright, my love. So, hey, Cindy. Hey, Mom. I know some people are coming. Keely's coming. The whole crew's coming. So, I'm going to ask my wife for a Bible so we can study the Bible. Thank you very much. We're all a little under the weather, so pray for us today. Good to see you, Keely. Good to see you, Cindy. Good to see everybody. Good evening. All right, so today we're going to talk about puzzles, symbols, and revelation. And it's kind of like a pattern that anybody can use so that as they're reading the Bible, what's that mean? What's that mean? What's that mean? What's that mean? You can have different tools at your disposal so that you can honestly ask God to guide you in truth. And if you believe, have faith, and trust that he will, the Holy Spirit will lead you in all truth. Of course, we have our basic fundamentals that we always go through. First John chapter 4, verse 8. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. This is considering others more important than you consider yourself. This is how God operates in every facet of his methods, his principles, his character. And he wove this principle into creation itself. Psalm 18, verse 30 says, God is perfect. And Malachi chapter 3, verse 6 says that God is unchangeable. So this love of God, where he considers others more important than he considers himself, and he does it in a way where he completely controls himself in every situation with a perfect, unchangeable love. This is, this is how the Heavenly Father is. And Jesus Christ revealed that to us. We talk about symbols, we talk about puzzles, and we're going to talk about Revelation. Not really the book of Revelation, though we'll get into that, but it's more of the revelation of what symbols do and how it unlocks the puzzles. Of course, we have our three fundamental Bible study principles that we use for everything. Principle number one, God is love. This is our main focus as we read Scripture. We need to see God considering his creation more important than he considers himself. If we don't see that being expressed, we need to question what's going on. Uh, Bible study principle number two is that the life of Christ reveals what the Father is actually like. John 14, 9, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. So the life of Jesus is perfectly and exactly what the Father is like. Third principle Isaiah 28.10, for precept must, must be upon precept. Precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line. Here a little, there a little. This is the puzzle principle, is that the precept is the divine principle. And divine principle must be upon divine principle. Scripture upon scripture, here a little, there a little. Divine principle explains the scripture. And scripture explains divine principle and today we're going to talk about puzzles and symbols and revelation and we're going to use all of these facets god is love we're going to use uh the life of christ as a revelation of the father to see the truth in the symbols and we're going to use line upon line precept upon precept and when we do that with an open mind and a teachable heart the holy spirit will lead us in a way where we are shown how to rightly divide the word of truth. Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 15 says that this is what we are to do. 
2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That is important. John 16, 13 says, How be it when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you in all truth. So it's a combination of a desire to know truth and then the Holy Spirit guiding you in that truth. And when that journey begins, God will take you through all these different uh, levels of understanding and to the capacity that you want to know as to the capacity that he's going to reveal to you. Every doctrine, every teaching is always with a central focal point that reveals the truth about God. It's a puzzle. Sometimes you got to look for all the pieces. Sometimes you think you have them all and you didn't realize one was stuck under here somewhere and you didn't know it was missing until the end. But there's here a little and there a little. And 2 Timothy 3.16 says this. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine. That's teachings, for proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So as we study the Bible, it's a process of doctrine, teachings. Sometimes those are not correct, and we need to double-check them. And sometimes we need to unlearn what we have learned with the ultimate point of having the truth about God, beholding Him, being transformed into the image that we behold, and then that gives us the capacity to live good and right lives. Every doctrine is designed to teach us the truth about God's love and how he has not only given us an unchangeable, perfect love, no matter what we do, no matter who you are, but he's woven that into creation itself. And as we behold this, we are transformed into the same image. And God in the Bible uses symbols and it's very important to understand why he uses symbols he uses symbols to confirm divine truth and he uses symbols to protect divine truth how god designed our brains to operate symbols are very important symbols explain physical reality that tell us of a spiritual truth now Symbols can be misapplied. Symbols can be misinterpreted. And so we want to be very careful to use the foundation of line upon line, line upon line, precept upon precept. Let the Bible explain itself, and it will. Uh, Isaiah 118. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. Come now. And let us reason together, saith the Lord. God wants us to go to him and have a conversation with him. He wants us to go and say, I don't understand this. What are you talking about? And he wants to have a, 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 a dialect, a reasoning with us so that he can bring us to the truth. I can't tell you how many times I've had a conversation with my wife and I'm like, this is what we're going to talk about in the Bible study. And she says to me, that does not make any sense. And after I've listened and I, I thought it through, I went, had to go to God and say, God, you need, I know you're telling me something, but I need you to make this make sense to other people. And within five minutes, the Lord will reveal things. And I've seen it happen time and time again. <coughs> but Jeremiah 29, verse 13, gives us a real understanding. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm a little sick of how this takes place. Jeremiah 29, 13. And ye shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. That's important. Because we can go to God and we can reason with him and we can be satisfied with a little bit. But God wants us to search for him with everything that we have. And when we go to God and when we reason with him, he will satisfy our desire to the capacity that we want. If I want to know a little bit about God, then he'll give me, he'll satisfy the heart's desire. If I want to know a lot about God, he will reveal to me what I'm capable of receiving. That's very important. 
And so today we're going to talk about the puzzle pieces and how to fit them together right. Sometimes it's a little bit of uh, elbow grease, but you invest in the scriptures. It's always worth it to invest in God's word. It strengthens you. It fortifies you. It gives you discernment. And it helps you to uh, understand what God really wants from us. And he says in 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved. Rightly divide the word of truth. And there's <coughs> Deuteronomy 29, 29 says this. A little too far. There we go. Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us us and our children forever that we may do all the words of the law now that doesn't sound very impressive and it doesn't sound like a lot but the things that god hath revealed to mankind are more than the mind can ma imagine once you begin to take a journey down the road of how god created existence to operate all the different divine principles that he has, all the different symbols that explain the great controversy, the truth about God, the truth about it. There's so much information that God hath revealed to us that uh, it, it, you'll never exhaust the truth in the Bible of what God has given to us. Matthew 18, 16. If you're looking for symbols, this is a principle to not get caught in like self-deception. Matthew 18, 16 says this. Matthew 18, 16. This is a principle now. It says this. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. This is a principle for piecing symbols together. If you want to have a teaching, if you want to have a doctrine, if you want to have some sort of biblical truth, you need to have two witnesses. And God establishes this principle himself. Genesis 41.32. Two witnesses. Genesis 41.32 says this, and for that dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice. It is because the thing is established by God and it will shortly come to pass. So God uses two witnesses to establish a thing. So if, you're, have a, if you think something is a symbol for something and you can only find one passage, I would be careful to say that this is a, a, a biblical truth. There should always be two scripture witnesses to establish the thing. And the symbols of revelation, there's a lot of them. But once you understand what the symbols mean, then you can have uh, an understanding that God is talking about the history of mankind. God is talking about the battle uh, between good and evil. God's revealing the great controversy. And he does this with symbols to protect information, to confirm information. And he's done this in a way as he designed our minds to associate pictures with large amounts of information. God can give us a symbol. And once we understand what that symbol means, we can look at the symbol and we can have a lot of information connected to it. Perfect example is when you teach a child uh, the color red. You'll hold up an apple and you'll say, this is red. But it's also food. But it's also yummy. And it also grows on a tree. And it's also fruit. So this one picture can be associated with massive amounts of information. That's the way we're designed to think. And this is what God does with symbols. Symbols can have multiple meanings. Right? If you look in Ephesians 6, 17, it says, The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. And I believe if you go to Romans 13, it also talks about another sword, which is the sword of the government. So you got to be careful. You can't get locked into one definition. You have to allow the Bible to put the right meaning in the right place. But 
you can interchange symbols. They can have the same uh, idea, but expand on information. For example, John chapter 1, verse 29 says, Behold, Jesus, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. So Jesus is the Lamb of God. John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goeth unto the Father but by me. So not only is Jesus the Lamb, Jesus is also truth. And in Revelation 14, 4, you see this. Revelation 14, 4. Revelation 14, 4. And they are they which are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. They follow the Lamb, whithersoever he goes. I'm talking about the 144,000. They follow the Lamb. We know that Lamb is Jesus. But to take it to a deeper level, we know that the Lamb is also a symbol for truth. They follow the truth, whithersoever it goes. And there's a big difference between people who follow truth and between people who follow Jesus. Not everybody who follows Jesus follows truth. Sad to say, but that's a fact. And so as you have these multiple meanings, you can gather in your mind greater and greater understanding of all the different facets of what God is trying to get through us as he's talking in symbolic language. Different symbols throughout the whole book of Revelation. We're not going to go through all these crazy symbols. Not crazy in a bad way, though some of them can seem crazy. But in the YouTube channel, <clears throat> we're not self-promoting. We're just saying this video, which will be connected to YouTube, in the description, I'll have a list of all the different uh, symbolic definitions and their scripture references. Uh, if you know any uh, that are not part of this, just make a comment and say, hey, I've noticed this symbolic uh, understanding is in this location for the people who are interested. But you see all different kinds of symbols. Uh, you see a mark. What does that mean? You see a beast. What does that mean? You see a horn. What does that mean? And it's important, too, because a beast and a horn are similar. Daniel chapter 7, verse 23 says, the, the beast is a world-ruling superpower. We'll see that in a minute. And in Daniel chapter 7, verse 24, it says that the horn is also a kingdom. But there's a difference. A beast rules the world, whereas a horn is like just a normal government that doesn't have any world ruling power. And once you see that in the Bible, you can tell the difference and you understand what's going on. You see in Revelation, pure woman, impure woman. You see a dragon. You see a lamb. You see wings of an eagle. That's important to understand. You see a forehead. You see hands. You see birds, you see cages, you see stars, you see bread, you see Babylon, you see Father. All of that is important. That's all in the, going to be in the YouTube video of this. If you want to know it, it's there with its locations. All these symbols are in the Bible, and each one's important as it reveals truth in its own specific purpose. And so we're going to look at a puzzle. And we're going to see that the Bible explains itself. We don't need to go outside of the Bible. But what we do is we take the Bible and compare it to history. right? God in his word literally said to us, everything that has been revealed to us is our right to know and understand it. That we may do all the words of his law. And so let's fit some puzzle pieces together. And then we're going to see a big picture of the great controversy. First puzzle we're gonna talk about is the mark of the beast. We're not gonna get into the who, what, where, when, and how. We're gonna look at principle. And once we see the principle operating behind the mark of the beast, we can say, ah, that's what's happening. Revelation 13, 16 says this. And he, the beast, causes all great and rich, great, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. And that no man might buy or sell, save he have the mark 
the name of the beast or the number of his name. All important aspects, all symbolic language that explains a system that warps the minds and character of God people. We see a beast, we see a mark, and we see a name. All this is important. All this is symbolic language. The mark is forced upon people. They're manipulated with fear to receive it. And if they don't, we know what happens to them. This is a system that is directly opposed to the love of God system. This is important. There's a counterfeit system in play that pretends to be a godly system but uses force, manipulation, and coercion and claims that it's a godly system. We see a mark. We see a name. We see a beast. Right? 1 Samuel 25, 25. As his name is, so is he. So if there's a name of beast, a number of a name, a mark, these are all symbols for the character that we develop in the particular system that we're in. So the mark, the number, the name, it's about... A system that perverts the character of man. What does a beast represent in the Bible? Daniel chapter seven, verse twenty-three. It's going to tell us we don't need we don't need a pastor to explain it. The Bible explains itself. Sh -sh -sh, wrong way. There we go. Daniel seven twenty-three says this. Thus he said, the fourth beast, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth which shall be different from all kingdoms and it shall devour the whole earth now those of us who study the bible and prophecy for a little bit know that there was four beasts in daniel's dream the first was a lion the second was a bear the third was a leopard the fourth was a monster and that fourth beast was divided into ten horns we know that Babylon was the lion. That was a world-ruling power. We know that the bear, Medo-Persia, was a world-ruling power. We know that the leper, Greece, was a world-ruling power. We know that that monster, scary monster, was Rome, and it was a world-ruling power. So a beast in the Bible is a, a kingdom specifically that rules the world. Very, very, very important. What does the mark symbolize? Ezekiel 9, 4. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and cry for all the abomination that be done in the midst thereof. And to the others he said, In mine heart go ye after throughout the city, Smite, let not your eyes spare, neither have pity. Slay the old, the young, the maids, the children, and women. But not do not come near any man upon whom is the mark. So the mark is a sign of approval. right? God puts his mark on these people because he approves of them. And he does not let the destroying angels harm them. Seems like God is sending the command to kill. But if you know God is love, if you know the life of Christ, and you know how Scripture can be seem like God is a killer, but that's not the truth. It only seems that way from the mind of the person that was writing that passage. Oh, I'm not making it up. We've proven it over and over. But we see that the mark is a sign of approval. So the mark of the beast would be a sign of approval from a government that rules the world. We, a lot of us know what this already is. We could talk about it, but that's not the point. The point is that there's a physical reality, the mark of the beast. And then there's a spiritual reality. The physical mark of the beast is the sign of approval from a world ruling power. But the spiritual reality of the mark of the beast the physical reality is that a government thinks that it can change God's law. That's important. That's the, the physical reality. A government thinks it can change God's law. <clears throat> the spiritual reality 
of the mark of the beast is how we view God's law. God's law is a law of love. It's unchangeable. You can't change love, right? It's self-control. It's considering others more important than you consider yourself. This is the actual only way to govern existence. Anything out of self-control and considering others more important than you consider yourself destroys love, destroys free will, and it begins a system of fear, manipulation, coercion, reward, and punishment. And this is what the mark of the beast is. The mark of the beast is a spiritual counterfeit that destroys the overlying principle of God's law, which is love, and it introduces a system of fear, a manipulation, of reward and punishment, and it masquerades as God's law. <coughs> God does not run his government that way. <coughs> God will never use force. He'll never use fear. He'll never use punishment. 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. Excuse me. <coughs> I'm a little sick, everybody. 1 John, sorry about that. 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear hath torment. He that fears is not made perfect in love. The mark of the beast is a system that uses fear, manipulation, and coercion to force worship. That's a satanic principle that is forced upon mankind in the, in, as a counterfeit for God's law. God's love, God's government, is all about free will. It's all about self-control. It's all about considering others more important than you consider yourself the mark of the beast and the counterfeit religious system that that is is a counterfeit love it uses force manipulation it coerces obedience into compliance and it channels a specific character into the minds of the people the mark of the beast counterfeit religious system opposes agape love and replaces it with a love for herself right because if i love myself if i want to be rewarded if i want all the good things that happen i will be obedient to this forceful manipulative system that is a counterfeit and i don't consider god more important than me i don't consider truth more important than me and it shapes and molds my character so that i end up viewing god as a destroyer that's the truth and we're going to see how this seed actually took place because the mark of the beast puzzle it's not a hard puzzle to figure out right the mark of the beast is it's, it's 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 a sign of approval from a government that's all it is but the spiritual aspect and how it warps and perverts the human character is the greatest deception and the second puzzle we're going to look at is how this all started and this is going to sound funny, but it all starts with the dragon's tail. Daniel, Revelation chapter 12, verse 3 and 4. Revelation chapter 12, verses 3 through 4. Revelation 12, 3 to 4. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. So we see a dragon. We see his tail and we see him taking one third of the stars and casting them to the earth. Job 38, 7. Job 38, 7. When the morning stars... When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. The star is a symbol for the angels, the sons of God. And so Satan, the dragon, uses his tail to gather one-third of the angels. And that's exactly what we see in Revelation 
12, 9. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. And that great dragon. The Bible is going to explain itself. And that great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan. We don't have to go too far. The Bible explains itself. That old great and the great dragon was cast out. That old serpent called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. In one passage, we see Satan taking stars with his tail. In another passage, we see Satan cast out, and he takes his angels with him. Now, it's funny because Jude chapter 1 verse 6 says this. Jude chapter 1 verse 6. Here we go, here we go. One more, one more. Jude chapter 1 verse 6 says this. And the angels which kept not their first estate but left their own habitation. That's a, we're talking about the same angels as in Revelation 12. Were they cast out? Did God use force? Did God kick angels out? Or did Satan use his tail to deceive the angels into leaving their habitation? That's important because if we don't know what the tail symbolizes, then this whole understanding can seem funny. Because in one place it says cast out, and the other place it says left. What does the tail represent? Isaiah 9, 15. Ezekiel. Oh, 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 oh. Isaiah, Jeremiah. Okay, Isaiah 9, 15. And what we're going to see is we're going to see the same thing as the mark of the beast. Ezekiel, Isaiah 9, 15 says this. The ancient and the honorable, he is the head. And the prophet that teaches lies, he is the tail. So when Satan uses his tail to draw one-third of the angels, the Bible symbol for a tail is a prophet that teaches lies. That's important because Satan, the dragon, when he uses his tail... He was using lies to convince the angels to leave heaven. So Satan becomes his own prophet, a lying prophet, and he teaches the angels things about God that are not true. And he tricks them into leaving heaven. And the Bible puts all the puzzle pieces together for us. I'm not just saying this. We're going to see the puzzle pieces put together. Ezekiel 28, 13. How... How did Satan use his tail? How did Satan use lies to deceive the angels into leaving heaven? This is how he did it. Ezekiel 28, 13. Ezekiel 28, 13 says this. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. A lot of us know that this is about to talk about Satan. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God, every precious stone was thy covering, the sardis, the topaz, the diamond, the barrel, the onyx, the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, the carbuncle, the gold, the workmanship of thy tabrets and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covers. I have set thee so. Thou was upon the holy mountain of God. Thou has walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. This tells us how Satan was able to deceive one-third of the angels. This is very important. There's a covering cherub. There's a mountain, and there's stones of fire. Each of these symbols has a large amount of information attached to them, if we know it or not. Exodus 25:18. Exodus 25, 18 says this, And thou shalt make two cherubs of gold. Beaten work shalt thou make them, and, and thou shalt make two cherubs of gold of beaten work. Thou shalt make them in the two ends in the 
mercy seat. Verse 20, And the cherubs shall stretch forth their wings on high, covering the mercy seat with their wings. This is the Ark of the Covenant. This is what the law is in. The mercy seat was on top, and on top of the Ark was two cherubs that covered, and their wings were used to cover the mercy seat. This is important. What was in the Ark of the Covenant? What was under the mercy seat? It was the law of God. And Satan was one of these cherub whose wings would cover the law of God. Exodus 19.4. Exodus 19.4. You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. The wings stand for divine guidance and divine protection. There's a second witness to this. Luke 13, 34. Luke 13, 34 says this. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which kills the prophets and stones them that are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thee, thy children together, as a hen gathers her brood under her wings but you would not. Jesus here is talking about the protection that the wings symbolize. In Exodus 19.4, God is describing the guidance and protection he gave the children of Israel as they left Egypt. So the wings that Satan had represent him guiding and protecting the law of God. That's very important. And it says that he was a cherub. We know what that symbol means. It means he was a protector and a guider of the law of God. We also see him in the mountain. Jeremiah 51, 24. Jeremiah 51, 24. One more page, one more page. Jeremiah 51, 24 says this. I will render unto Babylon. Now, Babylon is a country. It's a government. Now, see how God refers to a government as a mountain. I will render unto Babylon and to all the inhabitants of Chaldea all their evil that they have done in Zion in your sight. Behold, I am against thee, O destroying mountain. Important. The symbols are all there. we got to ask for God to show us where they are and to explain their meaning. But when Satan was in the mountain of God, he was part of the government of God. He had an anointed position as a covering cherub. He was closest to God. He understood the law. He was up close and personal with it. He protected it. He guided people in it. <coughs> And he walked in the stones of fire. Deuteronomy 32, 4. <coughs> Pardon me, I'm not feeling good today. Deuteronomy 32, 4. Deuteronomy 32, 4. He is the rock. His work is perfect, for all his ways are judgment. Justice, a God of truth, and without iniquity, just and right is he. When he walked into the fiery stones, he was walking with God, who is the rock. Hebrews 12, 29. Hebrews 12, 29 says this. For our God is a consuming fire. God is a rock. God is fire. Satan walked with God personally. He was in the government of God. He was in the mountain of God. When Satan walked in the fiery stones, he was walking with God personally. He was a part of his government at the top level. He, he was a guider and a protector of the law of God. So as we put these puzzle pieces together, we can see how Satan, with his tail, with his lying prophecies, took a one-third of the angels because he was in one of the closest positions a created being could have. And he was so trusted 
that if he said something, the angels believed him. So Satan walked in the holy truth of God, a representative of the government at its highest level, leading, guiding, and protecting others in the truth about God. Satan did that. And I'm sure that he was one, when he was just and right and perfect, I'm sure there wasn't a, a more qualified person save the Son of God himself. But something happened. Isaiah 14, 12. Isaiah 14, 12 says this. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? We can see why God says, how? How have you fallen from such a privileged position? How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut to the ground which did weaken the nations? For thou said in thine heart. That's important. The heart is the secret place of the mind. This is important. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also on the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. In the secret place of Satan's mind, he wanted to exalt himself. Only Satan and God knew that this was happening. But Satan said, I will exalt my throne. What does the throne represent? It's the seat of government. And every government has laws. So Satan, in his mind, created his own government, created his own laws. And he began to teach these things to the angels. And he began to say, God's law is not superior. God's government is not superior. My government is superior. My laws are superior. And he took one-third of the angels, and he exalted himself above them, and he became their God. He became their government. He became a false prophet, which caused them to leave heaven. Very important. I will exalt my throne. I will exalt my government. I will exalt my laws. And through deception... Satan began to lie about the character of God. He was, trust, he was one of the most trusted beings in existence. When Satan did not have a wicked thought in his mind, he was the greatest because he would serve. He, I guarantee you, when Satan was right with God, he was in the most trusted position because he was the best perfect guy he was created for the job but he began to have ideas he began to think in a way where my laws my government would be superior to God and he began to deceive the angels and we see the perversion that the lives of Satan works on the minds of the angels when the angels begin to uh, the demons now demons as the demons begin to interact with Jesus, we see the, what the lies of Satan did to their minds. Mark 1.24. Mark chapter 1, verse 24. Here we go. Shh, shh, Mark 1.24. And there was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, saying, let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. If this demon knew who Jesus was, he would know that he's not a destroyer. He's a creator. He's a giver of life. This is important because... Over the thousands of years of the, the demons following Satan, their ideas of God become perverted through the lies of Satan. This same exact thing happens to us. The reason why the mark of the beast and all this stuff happens as well is because the lies of Satan through the wine of Babylon warps and contorts the minds of men so that they begin to look at God 
the same way that Satan and the angels do. They have a complete misunderstanding of his character. They have a complete misunderstanding of his law. And they begin to do things in their own power, in their own strength, exalting their own thrones, their own governments, their own laws. And they use force, manipulation, coercion to force people to worship. Job chapter 10, verse 21. Now, when the angel accused Jesus of coming to destroy, the angel was accusing Jesus of having darkness because death, destruction, and darkness, they're all simple. They're all they're interchangeable. The same way that the Lamb, Jesus, and truth is interchangeable. So is death, darkness, and destruction. Job 10, 21. Okay. Job 10, 21 says this. Before I go where I shall not return, even to the land of darkness and the shadow of death. Darkness, death, and destruction. They're not a part of God. And if the demon would have known the truth about God, he would have known that Jesus could have never come to destroy because there is no darkness in him. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 says this. First John chapter 1 verse 5 this is then the message which you have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all darkness is always associated with corruption death iniquity and the Bible is clear there is no iniquity of God there is no death in God there is no corruption in God so for a demon to accuse Jesus of coming to destroy shows that the lies of Satan over time have perverted his view of God and that he no longer knows or understands the truth about God. And it's very important that as the Satan deceives the angels into thinking God kills, it's the same thing that Satan does with the people in this world today. The majority of mankind thinks that God is a killer. But Jesus says in John 14, 9, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And I've talked to pastors who said Jesus actually wasn't a full revelation of the Father because Jesus will be a killer when he comes at the second coming. I've talked to pastors. They've told me that personally, and I don't agree with that. I don't believe that. I believe that the life that Jesus lived he, when he was there before the crucifixion was a full manifestation of the character of God in its fullness of love, of agape love, of considering others more important than you consider yourself, of self-control. I believe that Jesus revealed that and replicated it perfectly. And when Jesus says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father, that when Jesus heals, that means the Father heals. When Jesus forgave, it means the, that the Father forgives. When Jesus gives life to the person who's dead, that means that God gives life to the person who did never not one time did jesus stop the heart of anybody who's was alive never not one time he could have did it nobody would have known he never did it when jesus was spat in the face and was crucified and then he forgave people that means the father will be spit in the face and crucified and forgive people that sounds horrible but that's the true revelation of the character of god if it happened to Jesus and he forgave, it could happen to the Father and he would forgive. What Satan did in heaven by deceiving the angels and coming up with a counterfeit system saying that agape love is, does not work and that I have a greater government and a greater set of laws and I can, I can lead you to a greater and deeper and holiness if you just follow me. That's the same thing that is going to happen with the mark of the beast. Mankind is going to be deceived, they're going to manipulate, they're going to force, and they're going to coerce people into worship, thinking that it's a way to serve God, but it's not really the truth. 
what Satan did with the angels through his lies was he brought them to a place where they could no longer trust God. We saw that in Mark 124. That demon was in a place where he could not trust Jesus. And this is exactly what Satan wants for all of us to happen. And this is what he's going to do with the mark of the beast. He's going to bring us to a place where we can no longer trust, believe, or have faith in God. Thinking that God destroys is wrong. He does not do it. Sometimes scripture can be hard to understand. But the symbols, the principles, the agape love, the life of Jesus, it will all make it clear as the Holy Spirit guides us into the ultimate truth of the character of God. God does not destroy. We destroy ourselves. Every symbol in the Bible is there on purpose. God put it there to protect truth, to convict of truth, and he did it to make you a critical thinker. He doesn't want us just to sit in a pew, listen to a pastor for 35 minutes a week, and go back to whatever. He wants us to reason with him, to search for him with all of our heart, and get into his word. Ask him, what does all this mean? Invest in the Bible 10, 20, 30 hours, and you'll have 10, 20, 30 hours of experience. Remember, there's a great controversy going on. God tells us exactly what is happening. It's not just the dragon took his tail and captured stars. No, it's deeper than that. And each puzzle piece is there. And once you have a picture of a dragon with the stars in his tail, and you know what the symbols mean, you see Satan in a high position of government, one of the closest beings to God, lying and deceiving his fellow created beings, getting them to leave heaven and turning their back, back on God, leading them in a place where their understanding is warped <coughs> so that they can no longer trust God. The same thing's happening down here in the earth right now. Use the different symbols. Use the different principles. Isaiah 28, verse 10, line upon line, line upon line. Principle upon principle. It, when you read the Bible, and you use line upon line, line upon line, and if you don't have an understanding of divine principle, which we, plenty of studies on Bible, YouTube, go look at them, there's a lot of them. If you don't know about the principles, you're going to read it from a carnal mind. The wrath of God. The anger of God. The vengeance of God. These are principles of how God interacts with his people. God is love. He considers us all more important than he considers himself. That's principle number one. Principle number two, Jesus reveals the truth about God's character. Principle number three, the Bible explains itself. And the Holy Spirit will lead us in that. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, The things that are revealed to us, that's, our, that's what God has given us. We have a right to it. Satan doesn't want us to know what he did in heaven. The Bible explains it clear. It's true, you got to put work in. you got to ask God for guidance. But it's all there. You don't need to go outside of the Bible. You can trust the Bible. And you can trust the Holy Spirit to lead you. And in Amos chapter 3, verse 7, God says, I'm going to, instead of quoting it, I'm going to read it. Amos chapter 3, verse 7. Here we go. Amos chapter 3, verse 7 says this. Surely the Lord God will do nothing. Surely the Lord God will do nothing unless he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. That's all in this Bible. It says that the Lord will do nothing unless he reveals it. So everything the Lord is going to do is already revealed to us. And in Deuteronomy 29, 29, the things that have been revealed are our right to know and understand that we may do all the works of the law. 1 Corinthians 10, 11 says this. Now all these things happened in the Old Testament. Now all these things happen to them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the end of the world is come. 
This is the end of the world. We're in the final timeline. And it's our right to know and understand the truth about God, who he is, how he operates, what are his methods and his principles, and can I trust him? Can I believe him? Can I have faith in him? And when you put God to the test and say, I'm here to reason with you, this is what I this is how I understand you. He'll reveal the truth of who he is. And it's designed for us who live at the end time because there's going to be probably more people lost in this time period than probably all time periods put together. So God's heart is for us. Scripture is for us. And these symbols, they're, they're, they're learnable. Look them. Two witnesses each. They're all there for you to grow. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to do Bible study. We thank you for whoever came. Not really sure who came today. But I thank you for your spirit. I thank you for your, your Bible. I thank you, Lord, for creating such a beautiful book that can never be exhausted. And the levels that you have woven into it to reveal your mind, your character, your methods, your principle is amazing. So, Heavenly Father, as we close this Bible study, we ask your blessing on all of us, that you would keep us, that you would sustain us, that you would provide for us, that you would fill us with your peace and your joy, that you would carry us through to the Sabbath, that you would fill us with your love for others, that you would give us a desire to get to know who you really are. So I ask for healing over my wife and I as we don't feel good. I ask protection over our house and everybody's houses that are here. And we ask that you just help us to prepare another study because we're not sure what to do. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And we thank you very much, Heavenly Father, for, for blessing us so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm. I love y'all. Have a good one.